So welcome to, welcome again, whether you're joining us online or you're here today, it is a privilege to open up God's Word and look at it together, and may we all be by His gracious work in our lives and preparing our hearts to be transformed and changed by it. So I'm going to jump right in. If you'll remember a couple weeks ago when I choose to show up, I actually was going to preach. Um, a couple weeks ago, we started a series on the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. The, what is it? Five, six, seventh book of the Bible. And so we want to turn to Ruth. We're going to pick up where we left off in Ruth chapter 1. Uh, we looked at uh, how this family has, uh, because of famine, and because of famine, they've, they've left Israel, Bethlehem specifically, and they went off to the land of Moab, which is probably where they shouldn't have gone in response to the crisis. And while they were there, we learned that several things had happened. They, they initially, the plan was, we're just going to go for a little while. The term was, they're going to sojourn in Moab. Until the famine was, was uh, over in Israel, then they were just going to stay there. But lo and behold, they end up staying there like 10 years, and they get settled, and they've got families, and all, the, all that. But anyway, so we're going to pick up in verse uh, 3, if you will. Ruth chapter 1, verse 3, and we're going to read 3 through 5 first. Now, Elimelech, that's, by the way, Naomi's husband, that's the next word, Naomi's husband died, and she was left with her two sons. So remember, Elimelech, he's the, the patriarch of the family. He's the one that he brought them, took them to Moab, This her with him, with his wife and their two sons. Well, lo and behold, while they were there, we learned that Elimelech, her husband, dies. And then you think, well, okay, she would know that was man, that would hurt and that would grieve, and, and that was a tremendous loss, but she still had hope. What was the hope that she had? Her sons. Particularly, not only for relational and comfort, and, and, but more for security as well. Because in this time frame, there's no social security. There's no, but there's no social safety net. Your your security was in your family, in particular, your descendants and your children and your children's children and so forth. Who's going to take care of you when you're old? Well, your boys. So her husband has died. In verse four, speaking of her two sons, they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. And they had lived there about 10 years. And both Malon and Kilian, that's the sons, what happens to them? We learned last week, that, or a couple weeks ago, that their names were, were mean uh, sickly and failure. So sickly and failure, what happens to them? They die too. And we can chuckle because, you know, we're removed. We can chuckle because... And it is funny that their names are probably pretty foreshadowing and maybe even indicative, I don't know. But here they are. These two men have also died. Now think of this family. You need to put yourself here. For some of you, it's not that hard to put yourself in their shoes. But after they'd lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. We're going to find that there's several movements in this chapter. We're going to cover chapter 1, hopefully, by God's grace. There's several movements. But I mean, the starting place for all of the movements, the starting place that the book starts us out as, been leading up to, is a place, a starting point of loss. Loss in the most profound ways. This poor woman has lost her husband. This poor woman has lost her boys. And what I, what I, we will continue to read, we're going to see that this family was not, every indication I see and read in this text is this family was tight. They were close. And the starting point is one of profound loss. Tragic. Now these, these women are in a precarious position. They, they really, they, is, is Naomi from Moab? Uh, as a woman, as a foreigner, <laughs> does she have any rights, basically, or any uh, 
a position or privilege or even land in the place where she's living now without a husband or boys. None. None. The, the text only gives a few sentences here. And it's on purpose because it it's driving us towards something more important. But, but don't read this too fast. Uh, our losses may be very different, but we all can get an inkling of at least of what this woman is feeling, experiencing. Does that make sense? This is the starting point, okay? Interesting, by the way, all three women are starting from the same point, right? They've all lost the men in their life. Look at verse 6. Here's the first move. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. So what's happened? What word comes to word comes into Moab that some, Moab that something has changed back home in Judah and Bethlehem? What what is it? The famine has ended. We talked about the the cycle of judges. I wonder I wonder if we've changed from the judgment of God to the, to the deliverer and the and the peace that's coming. Maybe. But the famine has ended, and here she is with her her two daughters-in-law in a precarious, dangerous. Uh, destitute probably situation and then she said hey wait 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 back home there's food there's food well we might as well go home this is the first move interestingly who gets the credit who's come to the aid of his people the Lord Naomi heard that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them. And she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. So they left Moab, and they're on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. You gotta, you wonder, uh, is, she, is she heads home? Does she feel embarrassed? Man, we should have never left. Is she recognizing or feeling the, 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 the guilt or the shame of, of, of leaving and all of that? I mean, I don't know. Who knows what she's feeling beyond loss? But she heads home. And who's heading home, by the way? Who's all going back? Naomi, Forpa, and Ruth. Right? All three. Which is interesting. Both daughters want to return, or want to go. It's not a return for them, is it? This, uh, Judah, Bethlehem, is not their home. Where's their home? Where's their kin? And where's their roots? And it's back in Moab. They are Moabite women. And yet, these two women say, hey, I want to go back with Naomi. See, that says a lot about their family, if, if I think. I don't want to read too much into it, but this was not a, oh, thank goodness, I'm out from under my mother-in-law. I'm out. Right? No, they're like, no. There is care. There is concern. There is love. To the point of, I'm going to leave my land and go back to yours. But the story continues, and we may know this. Look at verse 8. So they are on the road that takes them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back. Go back, each of you. Each of you to your mother's home. And may the Lord show you kindness, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. So, Naomi looks at her two daughters-in-law, and what does she say as they're walking along? What, what she kind of realizes something. She goes, what should they be doing? Go home. Go 
home. And she begins to plead with them. And she pleads with them to urges them to go back. And she asks that the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel, does what to her daughter? See that? Go back. May the Lord show you kindness as you've shown me kindness. Now, someday soon we'll, we'll develop, we'll dive into this word chesed, H E S E D. And what he's, he's, she is saying, what she's asking, what she's praying in essence, is that God would show chesed, loving kindness. If this word is a rich word, it's a full word, multifaceted. There, there's no single word that, does, that defines what, no single English word that defines what chesed is. It, it is just jam-packed all over the place. But the best, the, the, the most succinct one, the definition I came across is one of loyal love. It is a loyal love for the other. And what she is praying is that God, Yahweh, would show loyal, covenantal, kindness, long-suffering, gracious love to you, my daughters-in-law. Just as you have shown loyal love, rich love, gracious love, others-focused love, compassionate love, kindness, and so forth, to me. So, what, what do we learn about Naomi's place right now? This is gonna, this is, this gonna, the tension is going to get really thick in a minute. But she's saying, I'm praying that God would bless you. That he would bless you. That he would show his, his kindness to you. And furthermore, may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest and security and all that that would mean in the home of another husband. So do you see the care and concern? Again, this family is, they're tight. They love each other. And they have experienced profound loss. And yet even in their loss, they're looking out for each other. Maybe some application for us in there, I don't know. But there's, so there, there's, there's the second move, if you will. The second move is go home, right? And then there's the logic of why she says to go home, and this makes perfect sense. Continuing on, verse 9. Rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. In spite of this, they're weeping, they're crying, they're hugging each other. And, and they said, no, 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 no. I'm not going back home. I'm going, we're both of them say, we're going with you. And then Naomi says, but Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. And even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to a son, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. <coughs> and the logic is absolutely solid, isn't it? There is, Naomi's like, listen, listen, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I appreciate your love and your, your chesed towards me. And, 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 and I want God, I want you to, I mean, there's so much more for you. Listen, I'm too old, I'm not going to get married. The logic is absolutely rock solid, isn't it? Go home. Go home to your families. There's no family here left. I'm too old to so marry my sons and so forth. This is absolutely true. But what, did you catch this? It is more bitter for me because the Lord's hand has turned what? Guys, <laughs> listen to her heart. It's not only that she's saying, I'm too old. It's not only that she's saying, listen, I don't even have a husband. Even if I did, if I had, an, if even if I could have another kid, it's going to take too long. We, it, the, listen, just go home. But there's another reason she says go home. 
go home because the Lord's hand is against me. This sounds like Job, doesn't it? Yes. Oh, and I don't know about you, and I pray it's not true, but I wonder if there's people in this room who have ever had a moment in their life where they feel like the Lord's hand is against them. Where, sure, it may not be a loss of a loved one, it may be, but there's times and seasons in our lives when, when we look around and it doesn't matter what we do, how we do it, how hard we work, whatever it means, it just feels like nothing is going right and you want to cry out, maybe if you're too pious or too smart and you know better, but you still want to cry out, God, your hand is against me. This is where she's at. Go home because the Yahweh that I'm asking to bless you is not blessing me. What a statement. I, you got, I got to pause for just a quick minute. I love it that God never, ever hides or diminishes or sugarcoats the pain we experience in life. Here is a vivid, almost visceral picture of a woman who is broken, and rightfully so. And she's come to the conclusion, the, the only thing that she can fathom, she's the only rationale is that God's hand must be against me. Clearly, it is. It's far more bitter for me. Go home. There's hope for you. There's not for me. And so the result is they wept aloud in verse 14, and then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. What's interesting to me is Orpah, she does return. And nowhere in Scripture, here or anywhere else, nowhere in Scripture does it criticize her for leaving, does it? Because she's doing, she, she's not doing anything dishonorable. She's doing... You could, you could almost argue, the wise thing to do. And so she goes home, and now here's this little fledgling of, of a family, and now they're down to two. And so Orpah leaves, but Ruth does what? Ruth says, oh, let me think about it. Ruth starts taking six more steps and turns around. No, what does Ruth do? What's it say? Clung. Clung to her. At this, they wept aloud, and then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. This is the third movement, by the way. It's actually not a movement, it's a to stay. <laughs> The non -movement. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. She's leaving. It's okay. I'm not mad at her. It's all right. Go back with her. Go back to your folk. Go back to your... You got, there's hope there. What does Ruth say? Ruth says, but Ruth replied, do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Now listen to this. You ready? Don't urge me to leave. Don't urge me to go back. She makes a threefold vow. Here we go. You ready? Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Hey, by the way, um, so here's the threefold. She's making a vow to Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Right? Where you stay, I will stay. Naomi, I am with you. 
I don't care where you go. You start trekking off to you know, Timbuktu, well, I guess I'm going to Timbuktu. You go back to Bethlehem, well, guess what? I'm going to Bethlehem. You turn around and you want to go back to Moab, guess what? I'm going to Moab. Wherever you go, I'm throwing my lot in with you. Moreover than that, that's her personally, then your people will be my people. Who are Naomi's people? Is it the people of Israel? No. She is a Moabite. So her people is who? The Moabites. In a very real sense, she is renouncing her nationality. You, Naomi, I'm in with your family, your people, your family, and your nation. I am no longer I want to be considered a Moabite. I want to be considered one of you. Wow. Naomi to her people, and lastly, this is the kicker, may your God, who's the God of Israel? Yahweh. Who is the Lord? Is the God of Israel the same God of Moab? My research says, if I remember right, it's uh, the god of Moab was uh, Chemesh, or Chemesh, or C-H-E-M-E-S-H. Anything but the god of almighty of Israel. False, pagan, worthless, decrepit, immoral, debauched god. She's saying, I am renouncing my religion, my background, my faith, and I'm throwing everything I got in with you, in your God, with God. Wow. Wow. If you, if you were a contemporary, if you're like, say, the, the first group of people that, that heard this story, would you expect Ruth the Moabite to respond in this way? No. If there's every every reason, every reason to go back. And yet here's this Moabite saying, I want to follow Yahweh. I am committed. I am committed. And, did, and by the way, let me don't urge me to go leave you, turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and the, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. So it's not even just this, this little hiccup, okay, I'll do it as long as you live, and then I'm going back. No. What does she say? Where you are buried, I will be buried. On one hand, Naomi, you can't even, get, you can't even die to get rid of me. I'm just, right there with you. <laughs> but her commitment is one for her whole life. Naomi could die tomorrow, and Ruth could live another hundred years, and Ruth said, I'm still with you, your people, and your God. Don't urge me to go. I'm, I'm in. This is absolutely shocking. And so, they head back. <clears throat> when Naomi realized, verse 18, that Ruth had determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. And so the fourth movement is they arrive home, verse 19. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Excuse me, what does Naomi say? Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Don't call me pleasant one. Call me Mara. Because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. She says, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. And so the last movement is they arrive home. They arrive back to a home for Naomi and new home for Ruth. And these women, they, 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 they see her coming, and, or she's arrived, and, and word gets around that 
she's back. And they run around, they look out, and they look at Naomi, and she's unrecognizable. Can this be Naomi? And I know it's been like 10 years or so, but man, that, that doesn't even look like her. No doubt part of it was, where's her husband? Where's her boys? Where are they? That can't be them. There were three of them when they left, and, and now I'm just coming back with this other this Moabite woman. And part of it, but I think there's more. <laughs> the pleasant one was no longer pleasant. The pleasant one was bitter. And she says, don't even call me by my name. I have a new name. My new name is Bitter. Because whose hand is against me? Who has afflicted me? Who is she blaming for her hardship? God. Don't call me Naomi. The Almighty has made my life very bitter. And, and the Almighty has brought me back empty. We'll talk about more of that in a minute. Can you once again hear the pain in her voice? This woman is honest. Her pain is so great, she doesn't even care how it sounds. There's no, there's no false religiosity here. <laughs> She's not like, well, things are a little hard, but you know, things are going to work out. It's, the good Lord's got a plan. No, what is she saying? No, let me tell you about the good Lord. <laughs> I don't feel it. So those are the four movements, physical movements, if you will, but there's other kind of movements in this story, isn't there? They all start from the, the starting point of loss, but what's the movement for Ruth? Ruth moves from loss to faith, doesn't she? Ruth experiences the loss. She's in just verse, almost as precarious a situation, and she moves from loss to faith. She sees it all, all that has gone on. She looks at the life of, of her mother-in-law, and in spite of all of that, or because of it, she still recognizes who she should throw her lot in with. She says, I'm with Yahweh, his people, and his child. Ruth's loss moves her, furthermore, to show and continue to show Loving kindness, patience, uh, loyal love, chesed, to Naomi. Even when she is saying, call me bitter. She said, I, I, I'm, no, I'm in. Ruth's movement is profound. <laughs> From loss to faith, even in the midst. Of all pain. Naomi, her movement's a little different. The text tells us, he, she says, uh, I have moved from being full to what? Empty. And then there's an interesting play on this when you read it in a literary term and way. Uh, there's, a, there's a play on this. When she left, when they left, I should say, initially, in the beginning, beginning of chapter 1, they were uh, empty on food, right? No food, we got to go because there's a famine, right? They're empty. But full in what sense? Full with family, okay? Now, at this point in the story, she says, I'm just straight empty. Now, the reality is there's been a change. Gone from empty on food, full on family, to what? There's food. I'll learn that in a minute. But empty on the family. There's a real subtle, uh, real, real subtle, maybe too subtle, uh, reminder for us. You can have all the food in the world. You can have all the riches. You can have everything you want and still be. And if it costs you your family, it costs too much. That's not the point of the story, it's just a gentle reminder. Okay. And so she says, I'm empty. So she, her, she's gone from, from uh, full, she would say, fullness to empty. That's a movement for her. Moreover, she's gone from loss to, what's her new name? 
bitter. So she's gone from loss to bitterness. Now again, let me be very clear. I'm not criticizing Naomi. <laughs> because if I'm honest, I'm way more like Naomi than I am Ruth. Because if I'm honest, I know like, ooh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can get bitter real quick. I'm not trying to be unkind. But her bitterness is to the extent where it's made her unrecognizable. Have you ever been around someone like that? Yeah. Have you ever looked in the mirror? <laughs> <laughs> she left the pleasant one and she comes back unrecognizable. There's a bitterness distorts. Bitterness distorts. <laughs> It distorts us physically, it distorts us emotionally, it definitely distorts our view of reality. Naomi could not see what she had. Yes, Naomi has experienced tremendous loss, hasn't she? Off the charts loss. But what does she still have? Who's standing next to her? Here is this woman who without any good reason is choosing to stay with her. Could she be a gift from God to say, hey Naomi, guess what? I'm not done. But she couldn't see it. I, you know what I mean. She could see it and she, no doubt she appreciated it. She loved her and so forth. But nonetheless, she says, Call me Mara because the Lord's hand is against me. Because she actually began to believe and understand in her heart that Yahweh was actually against her. She couldn't see the truth, could she? Because bitterness distorts. She honestly couldn't see any possibility of anything good in the future. Go home because God's done with me. Go home. There's nothing good that's ever can come. You see what you, am I reading into this too much? I don't think so. And I want to be real careful with this. And then furthermore, she moves from Naomi to Mara. Her name, her identity would be one of pleasantness. And now what is her identity? What is she claiming her identity to be? Bitterness. Not only am I bitter, I am bitterness. I don't think it's too far a stretch because this is a real danger when we face loss in our lives and tragedy and trauma and all that stuff. The real, there's a real danger that when we face that, that we actually take that loss and it becomes who we are, our identity. Have you ever been that person? Have you ever been that, around someone who's done that? where their entire life, entire emotions, entire thoughts, entire, everything about them is about the loss. Naomi has literally said, change my name because I am bitter in God's hands again. That's a big difference from saying, my name is Naomi, I am an Israelite, I'm God's child who has experienced loss. To I am bitter, whose God's hand is against. Okay, that's the end of the chapter. Have a great week. <laughs> Application, real quick. Who do you want to be? And I, it's a simple, low hanging fruit application, but it's a right one. And I know we would all say, I want to be Ruth. <laughs> But do we recognize, one, it's so easy to be Naomi in this situation. It's understandable. Every good reason to be. I'm not saying we can't grieve. I'm not saying we, we, that we don't go. I'm just saying. Who do we want to be? What movement do we want to take? Here's Ruth showing loyal love and kindness to others, trusting in the Lord even in her loss. Can I just say, this will be a common application through the rest of this book. We need to be Ruth to other people who are facing thought. Because in doing so, we will remind them of the faithfulness and love of God. 
in their lives. Uh, or we could be Naomi. Again, not vilifying her in any way, shape, or form because bitterness is easy. Bitterness is almost even justifiable. But to show love, to be faithful, to trust, is hard. We've all been Naomi in many situations and times and seasons in our lives. We, we all may well be in the future. Because I know one thing about life is that What's that phrase? I just heard it this week. Either you've just come out of a hard time, or you're in it, or you're coming out of it. You're in it now, or in the future, you're going to experience loss. And we, just as last week, there's all different kinds of loss, isn't there? And again, there are Naomi's all over. There's Naomi's in our lives. Maybe a Naomi looking at back at us in the mirror. There's certainly Naomi's all over us. And may we be the roof around for them. And may we be people who, when we experience loss, we move to faith. Which brings up the point of how. First, I want to remind us of something. Was, was God really against Naomi? Even in God's harsh hard, justifiable, and accurate, and righteous judgment against uh, rebellious people of Israel, was he ever against them? In, in the sense of, I want to destroy you? No. I need to be careful, though, here for a minute. Our sin... Our our very sinful nature, which is just you know verified by our sinful acts, <laughs> what does that do with us in a relationship to Holy God? It places us under His judgment, doesn't it? And we, it places us under His righteous wrath that we deserve, right? That that spiritual, eternal, ongoing death of separation from Him. Does that make sense? That's what we deserve. And it, it, it says God is very much against our sin. His holiness demands it. And since we're attached to that sin, it's not a good place to be. Nonetheless, God's loyal love towards us compelled him to do something about it. What is it that he did? He sent his son to die on the cross for us. So by this, this, this gracious act that he's shown us and, and this work that he's done for us on our behalf, shedding his blood... Paying, the, paying the, the suffering and the payment needed, for the, enduring the judgment that we deserve on the cross, being forsaken by God, right? Now, by, by, by choosing that, by, by, by His gracious work, through faith, we are saved. And so now we move from being underneath God's wrath to underneath His grace. Right? And so now, as a Christ follower, as someone who's made that decision, now, can I ever, 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 ever say that God is against me? No. Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verse 6, re repeats an Old Testament passage. It says, um, for, for I will never, God says, I will never leave you nor what? Forsake you. And let me, I don't want to be too loose with this. My hand will never be against you in the sense of forsaking you. Does that make sense? And how is that possible? Because Jesus Christ, God, sent his only son to die on the cross. And on that cross, he was forsaken. The hand of God was absolutely, in, in, in a very real sense, if not unfathomable sense, was against his son. Right? And because of that, that is how I can now and look at the loss in my life, and I don't have to get to the point where I'm bitter. I don't have to get to the point where, where sure, I'm hurting and I'm grieving and I'm, and, and I'm confused and, I, and all that. But I know, I, I know because Christ died for me, I know that he's not against me. 
And furthermore, take it to the next step. Not only is he not against me, what is the future he have for me? Could it be that in the midst of my loss, there's, there's more to what God wants to do in my life and in my story? Right? And this is where the text begins to lead us. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving at Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. What? Well, that's quite, that's quite the lead-in. We'll explore what that means next week. Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this morning. And I know there are people in this room the sound of my voice that have are and will be, will experience profound loss remind us and God that by your grace and your gracious work on the cross that when we call upon you for the salvation of our souls that we trust in the work and trust in Jesus as the one who saves us paid the penalty on our behalf that we have new life and new standing with you. Remind us that as one who's made that decision, your hand is never against us to destroy us, but it, it may be one that brings discipline and correction, and that's not fun. But it is one that can use loss to bring us home. Thank you, God, that you are continually working in our lives to draw us home to you, to move us from, from the loss of where we're at to the love and the loyal love found in you. We love you in Jesus' name.